So hi everyone. Uh, I'm Carlos, with who I didn't speak. I'm Valentin Frédéric Juril, uh, an old postdoc. Uh, no, uh, yes, a postdoc hired in the frame of the new Tenji project, with, working with Costanza Bonadonna and also uh, Daniel and Eleonora, which she is perhaps hearing us now. And so I will present some results we obtain uh, in the frame of deliverable uh, 4.5. And so this presentation will be divided into two parts. So I'll be presenting the data-driven part, and Luigi then will talk a bit about the model-driven part uh, related to the data usage for hazard analysis. So hazard analysis related to uh, this, which is uh, a paroxysm at Etna. So Etna is the, 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 the case study of this, uh, of this particular deliverable. And The, the arrow, the bottom arrow. Yeah, it is. Okay. So Etna's, sorry. Uh, so Etna's paroxysm, uh, you have a picture here of uh, what we typically observe during this type of eruption. So basically, an Etna's paroxysm will be uh, characterized by the emission of a lava fountain uh, that can uh, reach heights between 100 meters up to more than one kilometer above the vents, which is feeding a tephra plume. So tephra. This is the name for all the volcanic particles, which is eventually reaching a top altitude and then will be dispersed by the atmospheric winds. In addition, we can see it on this picture, we have overflowing lava flows that will go down to the flank of the volcano. So since 2011, we had more than uh, 100 paroxysms occurring at Etna. And the issue with those uh, eruptions is that when the ash is dispersed in the atmosphere, uh, there will be some sedimentation of tephra on the ground that can affect the population. And the dispersion in the atmosphere of the ash can affect also the air traffic. So there is a need of under understanding those eruptions and, and, and potentially uh, forecasting the site of the eruption be before it actually starts. Um, so this uh, work in the frame of Newton G uh, is directly related to what we have done in another project, which was your work. Because at Etna, we have uh, access to a large set of remote sensing systems that are used to characterize what we call the eruptive source parameters. And those parameters are multiple. Ba basically, we have the mass suction rate, so the, the quantity of particles emitted in the atmosphere, the height of the plume, and the grain size distribution. And so we measure those parameters, and they are important because they are used to initialize the dispersal models that we use operationally to forecast the dispersal of those plumes. Uh, so having a large set of sensors is good also because we have access to uh, complementary detection windows using satellite, Doppler radars, also uh, visible camera and LIDAR and so on. We can provide various information during the paroxysms, including during various phases of the paroxysm. But unfortunately, here it's not really interesting because we have no information on the bulk pre-eruptive processes, so we have no information on what's happening below the volcano before the, the eruption actually starts. But Daniel published an interesting paper in 2015, in which he so he used one gravimeter located uh, less than one kilometer away from uh, the active, one of the active vents of Etna, and he showed that before seven paroxysms uh, occurred in July, between July and September 2011, that we do observe gravity decreases before the paroxysm actually starts. And those gravity decreases, then we can ask the question, are they related to what's happening below the volcano? And can they be related to what we observe during the eruption? According to Daniele, those gravity changes, not only Daniele, of course, uh, those gravity changes may be due to gas accumulation in the magma chamber and to foam collapse. So a foam is forming, uh, the accumulation of gas is forming at the top of the magma chamber and it can eventually collapse and uh, trigger the eruption. So this is driving the different phases of the paroxysm. But the main question is, can it be used to forecast the size of the paroxysm? So to do that, we do simply a, a, a simple comparison between what's measured during the eruption by the remote sensing uh, systems and what's measured by the gravimeters before and during the paroxysm. So mainly we use two different types of remote sensing systems. Firstly, satellite infrared observations, uh, for which we, we analyzed uh, 24 different paroxysms. 
And thanks to this uh, technique, we can have access to uh, the quantity of ash, which is released during the eruption, and mainly the fine ash, so the particles that are below 20 microns, and also to information on the gas, mainly SO2. We use also uh, an X-band Doppler radar, which is called a weather radar, located at Catania Airport, 30 kilometers away from the Philippines, for which we had um, data for 16 different paroxysms. And here, unlike the satellite, which correspond only to particles that are really fine, we can have access to mass of tephra from ash to small lapilli, uh, meaning from millimeter sized particles up to centimeter sized particles. So in the time of this work, we had only access to three different gravimeters. So the two superconductive gravimeters, I graph, graphs, I graph in French, uh, that were located at Celalanave and La Montagnola station, and also to the AQGB, or three, which is located at uh, PG Denery, as Vincent uh, showed you uh, before. Okay, so without going into too much detail on the, on the, on the, on the estimates we obtain with the remote sensing systems, I give you some numbers here. But what's important is that either from a satellite or radar point of view, we obtain values of mass of ash and gas that are uh, coherent with previous activity and mostly related to weak uh, paroxysmal activity. Another interesting uh, data that we have uh, we have used is the lava volume, because uh, Daniele will talk more about that. But uh, Mehdi already speak a bit about that too. Gravity, uh, the gravity changes of Salvatetna are due to mass changes below the volcano, and those mass changes not only consider the ash which is emitted during the paroxysm, but also the lava. So we need to consider the full aspect of what's emitting during uh, emitted during the eruption. So as I said, everything that we have measured is similar to the previous activity. So now going to uh, the gravity measurements now, you have here a time series of uh, what has been measured in February 2021 by the two eye graphs. So in purple is the one at La Montagnola station and in blue, the one at Celaranave. And on the top here, you have the measurements of the tremor activity at the ECPN station, uh, uh, CPN being uh, Cratele del Piano. And as you can see in the gravity changes here, we observed for each paroxysm, the peaks uh, in the tremor activity here correspond to, to, to each paroxysm. We do observe also peaks in the gravity uh, changes. And in fact, those peaks are not due to the change, the real change of, in the gravity field, but to instrumental response due to inertial acceleration because of the ground shaking. So this is not exploitable in this form. But when we go closer to, to, to the time series, especially before each paroxysm, we do observe uh, interesting features in the, the gravity uh, time series. So still here you have the Montagnola uh, eye graph and below you have the, the Celadan one. So we do observe before each paroxysm, not, not all of them, but we do observe gravity decreases similar to what Daniel observed in 2011. And those decrease, it's interesting because they are occurring when the tremor is flat or slightly increasing. Um, you can see here that the, the Montanula uh, high graph was quite noisy, noisy, so we have a better visualization here uh, using the Celalan AV1. Typically, those decreases are uh, below one microgal and starts between 200 uh, and 2000 minutes before the start of the paroxysm, and they ends before the start of the paroxysm. Here yeah, you have now the, uh, a similar time series, but in June 2021, in which we see similar observation, although uh, the signal at La Montagnola uh, is better and less noisy. So we do uh, observe uh, gravity decreases before paroxysm in bo at both stations, but not for all the paroxysm, as you can see here, and sometimes during strombolian activity that takes place days before the paroxysm. So here we'll talk um, very, very, uh, very quickly about the AQGB data because as I told you, we use this uh, gravimeter for, for for this for this work. So um, as Vincent told you this morning, there was uh, so the, 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 there was an acquisition re which we start at the end of May 2021, and so we had access to more than 22 paroxysms in June, September, and October. But unfortunately, with the remote sensing data, we only had access to seven paroxysms. So this is not a lot of points to compare with. But regardless, you can see that there are some gravity decreases before uh, the power season, which is displayed here in, uh, in June 2021, which is about a few microgas and uh, starts five to, uh, four to five hours before the power season after signal treatment. 
You can see also that uh, we have the Montagnola uh, agra signal here as a comparison. Why there is a decrease of cell here, there is no decrease of cell in the same time scale uh, with the HOGB. So regardless of that, given the small number of, uh, of data we had with the HUGB in, com uh, in common with remote sensing data, and also the difficulties of seeing such decrease before the proxy, we didn't use uh, the HUGB data in the frame of the clearly variable, but we want to, to, to go further into uh, detail of this uh, of this argument of the following. Okay, so I won't present this slide because I realized Daniele will talk very much better than me about that. So this is why uh, I said that here, uh, because he's more expert than me. But we can use also the three different gravity meters uh, uh, to, to study the long-term gravity decrease, uh, especially in that period, which was between June and July 2021, for which we had 22 uh, paroxysm and an overall deflation of Mount Etna. And Daniel will present you the use of a jointed version, especially using the pattern search algorithm, for which we can uh, find uh, several quantitative uh, parameters about the source. Okay, so now here you have uh, one of the main results, which is the, the direct comparison with those gravity decreases that we observe and the mass of lava, the mass of lava plus tephra, so something which is close to the total routine mass, and the mass seen by satellite, so the very fine material emitted in the atmosphere. And you can see that even though they are rough, there are existing correlations between uh, these gravity changes amplitude, decrease amplitude, and the remote sensing estimates. While for the satellite point of view, there is no uh, good correlation with the gravity uh, signal. Unfortunately, when we consider the duration of the decreases, so we, we obtain the, the rate the, of the decrease, it worsens the correlation. And this might be due to the fact that uh, we lack of an objective visualization of those decrease. Because, for example, when we were treated the data, you obtained some values, and then Daniel treated the data, you obtained different values, and so on. So, <laughs> we still an effort to make to have an automatized um, uh, algorithm or an automatized procedure to 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 uh, to characterize those decreases. So here, before letting uh, Luigi start. Uh, I will leave you some, some conclusive remarks uh, for this. Even though the results uh, present some rough correlation between the remote sensing and the gravimetry, uh, this is one of the first attempts to evaluate the real uh, capacity of, gra of, of gravity data to provide quantitative information before uh, explosive eruptions, especially at, at Montetna. So I've presented you here a short-term use of those uh, gravity time series at Etna for volcanology monitoring. And then Daniel will present you more long-term uh, use of those gravity decrees. And for sure, so we need to discuss more about that, and, but not in the frame of this, of, this, uh, of this presentation, but we need to obtain more data, especially regarding the actual GP acquisition, because we observe way much more uh, interesting features, especially during the eruption, but we are still not sure if those uh, features are due to uh, gravity changes or to instrumental response due to the ground shaking. So we need more, more acquisition and, and more uh, study on those signals. And one alternative to, to, to continue with that would be the use of MEMS uh, or spring gravimeters, of course, to validate the real capacity of those gravimeters for uh, volcano monitoring. That's it. Thank you. 